A few years ago, we told you about an ambitious plan to grow fruit and vegetables undercover with just seawater and sunlight. Skeptics doubted the idea would get past the experimental phase. But next week, the company behind it, Sundrop Farms, officially opens a commercial greenhouse in South Australia, which is already producing thousands of tonnes of tomatoes for a major retailer. And as Kerry State reports, the futuristic looking facility is set to be the first of many. It's a vision many thought wouldn't get off the ground. But 300 kilometres north of Adelaide, the future of food production is looking very bright from every angle. This is a very, very special project. It's, it's not just the first for Port Augusta, this is the first in the world. Four years ago, Landline visited Sundrop's pilot plant on the outskirts of Port Augusta, set up on unproductive country between the Flinders Ranges and the Spencer Gulf. It consists of... Uh... An international team of water and engineering experts had been assembled to work out the best way to grow tomatoes with just seawater and sunshine. What we were really looking for when we built this team is uh, people who had a passion uh, for changing the way agriculture is done. So when you were last here, we're about 100 in size. We're at today. And how things have changed. That smart idea is now a spectacular commercial reality. Since uh, you were here last, we've grown 100 fold. We're now in the midst of. Uh, our mirror field of 23,500 little mirrors and uh, our greenhouse is 20 hectares instead of 2,000 square meters. So quite a big change. German-born uh, Philipp Saumweber, a former investment banker with a background in funding international agricultural projects, runs Sundrop. He's teamed up with Dutch civil engineer Rainier Volterbeek, who has a master's in water management. So we're in this, this solar field. I mean, what actually happens? What do the mirrors do? So when the sun comes up over the Flinders Ranges, these uh, mirrors have identified that the sun is there. They basically go into an angle to receive this uh, solar flux from the sun and point it onto the uh, receiver at the top of the tower. Uh, and how much energy are you actually capturing, I guess? Peak performance during summer uh, sits around um, 39 megawatt thermal. This 127 metre high glowing centrepiece and the solar energy it captures are the keys to keeping everything running below. If I split it roughly, half of it goes into just heating needs for the greenhouse. That's a big cost, uh, usually. Um, about 30 to 35 percent goes into making water, and then the rest is for electricity production. A solar boiler at the top of the power tower, as it's known, produces steam, which drives a turbine to create electricity. Any unused heat is transferred to a thermal energy storage tank, the biggest in the southern hemisphere. Indeed, everything here is big. And it's a nice change for Rainier Volterbeek, who has worked in pilot greenhouses until now. Yeah, occasionally you need to pinch yourself. Um, it is uh, obviously it's amazing to uh, to see that um, uh, that what you think could work actually works. Some of the original design has been tweaked. The pilot plant had curved parabolic mirrors, which looked good but were hard to clean. So when it was scaled up, the team opted for flat everyday mirrors. The mirrors are actually just normal bathroom mirrors. Um, obviously the size, um, I don't know how big your bathroom is, but uh, they are two uh, square meters each. Um, but yeah, they're ordinary mirrors. 
And unlike at the pilot plant, thermal oil is not being used to capture and create heat here. When you use thermal oil, there's increased risk from a fire risk perspective. There are stories of some solar fields uh, uh, catching fire, which isn't great. Um, and there's also an environmental perspective around using thermal oil. At the end of its life, it needs to be disposed of. We've completely gotten rid of that here. We now run a, a complete closed loop water system. Which brings us to the other major ingredient that keeps this operation afloat. Salt water, piped from the nearby Spencer Gulf. This is used for heating, cooling and irrigation. But before it can water crops, it needs to be converted to something more palatable. So you've got this... And that's where the stored heat in the big tank and this thermal desalination unit come in. Seawater goes into this unit. We're extracting heat from the big uh, heat storage tank that basically starts evaporating the seawater. Um, that seawater vapor, if you condense that, that becomes fresh water. And, and what goes into this other tank, this smaller tank next to it? The waste heat from this process, which is normally dumped into the ocean, we can actually reuse for greenhouse heating. So we pump that waste heat into the uh, second uh, heat storage tank. After the desalination process, the leftover salty water is cooled and diluted in a big pool before being released back into the Spencer Gulf. This is where the fresh water is kept. Now, it's undercover to keep contaminants out, but the pond holds 25 million litres. And every day, on average, a million comes in and about the same is pumped out and piped to the greenhouses. This is Adrian Simpkins' world. He spent more than two decades running tomato greenhouses in Europe and North America before joining Sundrop as head grower. And he says the desalinated water is far from second rate. It's almost the perfect water. So you, you, you're taking all of the salt out of it. There's no disease aspects. It's very pure. And then we're able to enhance it with um, the nutrition that the plants require. OK, Kerry, so this is where a grower should spend most of his time. As the boss in here, it's Adrian's job to keep on top of these fast-moving plants, which grow around 30 centimetres a week. And that means plenty of hours up high checking on the crop as it flowers. So if we make mistakes up here, then we'll see it for the next eight weeks. So you pull these out every 12 months, but it is a, a perennial plant, so why do you do that? Yeah, that's correct. I, the way that we push these plants, I liken it to a 100-year-old person. You just, you're not running a marathon like you used to. There are four greenhouses identical to this one. And almost two years after construction started, they're all producing at full capacity with Sundrop expected to deliver at least 15,000 tonnes of tomatoes a year. I think when you look at um, population growth and uh, water shortage, we need to be able to produce food in a very efficient manner, maximise the amount of space that's available and minimise the impact on the environment when it comes to water usage. So this project, it really is, you know, a, a big step forward. While they had to be smart when it came to sourcing water, one thing there's no shortage of, as long as enough leaves are removed to expose the crop, is light. The more light you can give plants, the better they grow, the better they taste. So we're in a location that has about 320 sunshine days a year, which is pretty good. Um, and from that perspective, the site has worked out really well. What we have is really hot summers, and those are sometimes challenging, but we managed to cool the greenhouses down to a temperature where the plants continue to be happy and, and, and grow well. To cool the greenhouses, seawater is released over cardboard pads that have been installed in the walls. Fans draw hot air from outside through the wet pads, creating cooler air, which is then circulated through the growing rooms. Like many of the processes here, it's relatively simple. What's more complex is bringing all the different parts together. 
I can count the number of times I've, I've cried in my adult life on one hand, and, and two or three of those times have been Sundrop related. There's been countless things that, that, that have gone wrong here. You know, we've had a roof blow off the greenhouse on a 45 degree day. Uh, we lost our entire trial crops. We lost, you know, team members in, in times when it was most critical because, you know, we, we, it took us four or five years of being in a trial facility. Not everybody, not, not every high caliber grower wants to do that. So we've, we've had all kinds of challenges. Attracting workers remains a challenge. Now there are a couple of hundred jobs to fill. But the company says it's tapping into local skills, with 70% of workers coming from the region. People did think that we couldn't find the right people for horticulture locally, but we have been able to. That being said, you know, there is a limited skill base for a uh, high-tech greenhouse growing in Australia in general, and some of our growers, um, but that's really only uh, two or three people, are from abroad. So they come from places like Holland, uh, the, the United States, etc. cetera. Um, but most of the people here are, are Australians and are locals. It's a welcome jobs boost after one of the area's major employers, Port Augusta's power station, closed this year. But while the once dominant but now deserted coal-fired facility is these days overshadowed by its new solar-driven neighbour, this renewable energy project still relies on grid utilities for 10 to 15 per cent of its power needs, especially during winter when there's less sunlight. That's our best insurance policy. Uh, so we have storage on site for about 10 days for water, uh, for heating, uh, cooling, electricity. But you know, if we have a if we have a problem on site, we need to rely on on the grid. As we fine tune the system, we'll use less and less uh, fossil power, uh, and then rely more and more on the infrastructure you see behind me. While the environmental savings are significant, many thought the financial costs would make this project unviable. But the boss says even though the initial infrastructure investment of around $200 million is more than what a traditional greenhouse operator would spend, it pays off down the track. Fossil fuels can make up uh, probably up to around 50% of their operating expenses. We bring that right down. And when you look at what we're depreciating, uh, the cost of this asset every year, it's much lower than what they're spending every year on fossil fuels. So there's a significant saving. To achieve that significant saving, the company first needed a significant investment to be able to expand. That came from private equity firm KKR, which is contributing $100 million. And something that helped convince the global giant to get on board the Sundrop train is the 10-year contract the grower has secured with retailer Coles. It is unusual in the sense that it's the longest agreement we have in horticulture. It gives them security about broadly about what they'll be paid and it gives us security about the volumes that they're going to grow. Sundrop is growing just one variety of trust tomatoes and everything it produces goes to Coles. The retailer's head of fresh produce says what comes out of this greenhouse won't saturate the market or push smaller tomato growers out, but it will affect prices. Tomatoes are one of our top 10 selling lines in the supermarket and they're growing very quickly. Particularly in winter, there is a gap between supply and demand and what Sundrop will do is fill that gap. What I would say is in winter, my personal belief is that customers have to pay too much for Trust Tomatoes and what Sundrop will do will be allow us to give better value to customers but also to provide a great return to suppliers through that period as well. Sundrop may have a secure market, but after just a few months in operation, there is still some uncertainty surrounding this ambitious project. Namely, will the facility, which combines technology from all over the world and is designed to run for 25 years, last the distance? If you design a new car, maybe the first 10 kilometers go fine, but does it still run after like 2,000 kilometers or 200,000 kilometers? Uh, I think, does, is it going to live up to its design life? That I think is, uh, is obviously a question that we can only answer over time, um, but we're confident. 
confident enough to develop more of these sustainable greenhouses. Sundrop already has facilities opening in Portugal and the United States, and it has another one planned for Australia. While it's keeping the details under wraps for now, it says the first step for each project is to partner up with a retailer. Once we understand what the client's requirements are, then we design the greenhouse around it. When we know what the greenhouse looks like, then we can design the sustainable infrastructure around it. Um, so no, it won't always be a power tower um, and it won't always be seawater, um, but it will always have a uh, sustainable uh, resource angle. The water may not start out as fresh, but thanks to a lot of clear thinking, what leaves this groundbreaking greenhouse is. And a light bulb moment that some saw as laughable is now looking a lot more lucrative. The facility behind us is already testament to the fact that life is better than it used to be at the, at the, at the pilot facility. Uh, we're on salaries now. You need to be an optimist. You need to think about what you have and not so much on what you don't have. And I think this is a great example, right? Like, not a lot of people thought you could grow veggies in the desert, but I think you can. Um, and uh, yeah, if you think smart about it, and there is a solution.